Now the sauerkraut and things like this in, in cold climates, they live on things like this. Because it had been fermented, all of the enzyme activity would be there, all of the acidophilus will be there, everything will be there that the body would need. So you find in your colder climates, they, they're, they're always eating something which has been fermented in some way. And they live on it and they thrive on it. The, the one thing to realize with nutrition is that we're all starting in, in different places and none of us are anywhere close to an ideal diet. So bear in mind that on the one hand, you're going to get a lot of different uh, principles of nutrition here. And most of you are looking at it you know, as if you're going to move immediately towards some kind of 100% diet. And the thing about it is, is, is that's not going to work for most people. Virtually all of us are going to need to go through a long series of transitions where we're gradually going to be improving the diet. And as we start to, uh, to consider what to eat and what not to eat, I think it's important for all of us to learn to look at this in, in uh, not such black and white terms as most of us are, are uh, inclined to do and start to realize it's not a question of is this good or is this bad. There's a lot of gray area in between. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good and bad, but there's also a lot of, of just better and worse. And the thing to realize is, you know, you look at your, your, uh, your foods that you've grown yourself in your own soil, and they're, they're very, you know, good nourishing foods, and, you, and you, you, you happen to freeze them so you can eat some of those in the winter, you've lost some nutritional value there. But then how does that compare to foods that were grown, you know, say it's the winter climate and you're importing apples from South America? I mean, you've, got a, you've always got a bit of a trade-off there, and we have to start looking at the, the gray area and, and trying to do the best we can without being too fanatical about it. One question that I have. Okay. Excuse me. This has to be said. In this day and age, I would take an issue with what at one time I took Doug's position right to the line. The last 15 years I've taken this, the same line of moderation. But with the sick people that I've been seeing here as of late, I find that there is no moderation anymore. There's just no moderation. Uh, you cannot progress today on just a moderate program. You are still, you're going to retrogress a little slower on a moderate program, where today, frankly, nutritionally, we're fighting for our very lives in several different areas, and we can't just compromise ourselves and play the middle of the road, which we could say 15 years ago, because things are becoming more severe health-wise than they've ever had before. There's more cancer than has ever been before. Because of the lack of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, there's more viruses than ever before. There's more uh, type of bacterial infections than ever before. Take a look at your hospitals, and people are come, going into the hospital and coming out with incurable bacterial infections. You're, you're having things happen today that people just can't cope with, the doctors can't cope with, and even if people cope with on, a, on just a regular diet and moderate amount of point holding, they all of a sudden they're gone. And we're seeing it happen. People are dropping like flies all over the place on, on moderate diets where they're trying to go vegetarian, they're trying to do this, and they're not making it. And so I think that we have to move from a position of moderation uh, to a position of fanaticism. My question is in reference to the enzymes and um, more how the different ways that, that we're able to get them into our systems. And one thing that I was wondering about is how um, our bodies produce a certain amount of enzymes themselves. And we haven't really discussed that about how the digestive system in the mouth, different areas, secretes their own sources naturally of enzymes. And I'm wondering if the supplementation is because we don't produce enough or how that plays into it. You got that question? Let's start with our mouth, with saliva. If you are a vegetarian eating no cooked food, you will have no enzymes in your saliva. But if you do eat some cooked food, then you'll have about, about enough what they call tylen, which is an amylytic enzyme which will digest approximately about maybe 1 20th of your carbohydrate. But in your mouth, 
you have nothing which will digest protein and you'll have nothing which will digest your uh, fats although some people claim they're there in absolute minute amounts that don't amount to much okay so the basic thing we have then in the saliva is the tylen okay uh, P T Y A L I N tylen now that tylen uh, will digest carbohydrate now write down in your notes a little example that you can take just uh, take some good whole grain bread and have people chew it for about five minutes and all of a sudden it starts tasting sweet and here's where the carbohydrate is being broken down from just your regular complex carbohydrate into your simple carbohydrates which are your sugars now if you get a good book on uh, on medical physiology by Arthur Guyton I don't think you'll find a better explanation of the breakdown of your food using your enzymes that are naturally occurring within the body now Dana let's go on down esophagus nothing until it hits the upper part of the stomach and the upper part of the stomach operates like a huge holding tank okay and the enzymes then in the upper part of the stomach begins to break down the food that was naturally occurring with your raw fresh food if it's not fresh the enzyme will be deficient if it's not raw and it's been cooked the enzymes will be destroyed by the cooking and there'll be nothing in there to break the food down in the upper part of the stomach now as it starts moving down through the stomach then the only thing you have left will be the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin which will be released from the lining of the stomach okay which will be used to break down the protein but for most people today the hydrochloric acid is deficient everybody over the age of 30 will not have enough hydrochloric acid in their stomach to help to uh, to help the pepsin to okay the hydrochloric acid has to lower the pH factor down to around two to three so the pepsin is activated to break down the protein okay but there's not enough pepsin to do that so therefore the food goes through undigested into the small intestine and then most people have pancreatic problems today if they don't have hypoglycemia they have diabetes okay and so everyone is in that boat where the, when the pancreas goes that means that the body's on death's doorstep because the body is dying because the body the body has literally borrowed from every other part of the body to feed the pancreas and the pancreas does not have enough lipase to digest fat protease to digest protein carbohydrate uh, which is then digested by your amylytic enzymes it doesn't have enough amylytic enzymes you with me so most people are deficient in these things and there's not enough in your fresh and raw food to to help this along and so the body then has a certain amount of enzyme activity and when that enzyme activity is gone in the body the body dies alrighty does this help you okay Under, under normal circumstances, which would be fairly unusual, in other words, if your body was actually healthy, you would secrete it yourself. It would be secreted, it would be secreted from, the, you know, th from the lining of the stomach into the lower portion of the stomach to drop the pH. It can be taken as a supplement. A lot of people will benefit greatly from taking a, a supplement of hydrochloric acid, which is usually called your betaine hydrochloride. Incidentally, if you are going to, uh, if this is skipping ahead a little bit, but if you are going to take a hydrochloric acid supplement, it's absolutely imperative that, that you do this at the proper time, in the proper, in the proper sequence. The upper portion of the stomach, as John has said, is a, is a holding tank. And that upper portion of the stomach, for, for about 15 to 45 minutes after you've eaten, you have the opportunity for the enzymes that have come into the body from outside to work on the food. This would include the enzymes that are found in raw food, and it would also include your normal food enzyme supplements. Yes? Now, when you take your food in, you... Oh, sorry. Um, when you take food in your body, does that 
does that then decide at that point which enzymes are needed? What I mean is, if you take the enzymes in straight away, does that mean the body doesn't secrete enzymes that are needed for that food? But if you wait until after you've taken the food and then have the enzymes at the end of the meal, does that mean that your body's already started a secretion of enzymes and you've actually wasted the use of those supplementary enzymes to a point? You know, I'm a bit of a cack end way of saying it, but you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you read Dr. Howell's uh, works, there is what he calls the law of adaptive secretion of enzymes. And Dr. Howell has shown quite conclusively that the body does not, the body will never waste its own enzymes unless it has to. In other words, the body will try to use as few of its own enzymes to get the job done, the job of digestion, as it possibly can. If you eat a food that's primarily starches, the body, and you're not taking any enzymes with it, like eat a big bowl of brown rice, your body's not going to secrete a lot of proteolytic or uh, fat digesting enzymes. It's going to use a lot of amylytic or carbohydrate digesting enzymes because that's what's needed to get the job done. If you ate a lot of fat, the body would put a lot of lipase into the system. If you ate a lot of protein, the body would put a lot of protease into the system. The body is always going to prefer the enzymes from outside to the enzymes that it secretes itself. But if you waited too long to take your food enzyme supplements, you're quite correct in that the body would have already secreted a lot of its own enzymes because it didn't know it was going to get any enzymes from outside. It would be a good idea to, t to take them right at, the, you know, right at the beginning of the meal so that your body understands that there's enzymes present there. Let's go back here a minute, Keith. This might help answer some of your questions. If you take your hydrochloric acid too soon, it's going to lower the pH factor in the stomach. If it goes below 4.0 pH, then all of your enzyme activity in your stomach is rendered inactive. And that will not be reactivated until it gets down through the pyloric valve into the upper part of the small intestine where the pH then becomes more alkaline again. That's not lost, it's just inactivated. If you take the betaine hydrochloride too late, is that having, um, like if you, like I forget, half an hour after or three quarters, now it's a bit hard, you just reminded me to take it there and it's over an hour. If I've got undigested protein, what's ha that's already gone and I'm too late? That's too late, you missed the boat. And it, uh, what happens is, uh, as Doug mentioned, each person will vary. And there's a tremendous variation in the digestive system from one person to the next. And like one person, 15 minutes will be the right time to take it, the next will be 45 minutes. And uh, you're going to have to work that out and find out what is going to be the optimum time for you. And well, it, you'll feel good uh, when it's being done correctly. Otherwise, the food will just lay on your tummy like a lead weight. Um, the question is protein and cancer. Protein and cancer. Um, I have so many conflicting things, even with people who are practitioners and do body electronics, about the amount of protein with eggs, cheese, um, like goat's cheeses and things. I, I just get so confused. I wanted to hold this question, Lynn. Do you have it written down? Will you try to hold that question till tomorrow or tomorrow afternoon? And we'll try to discuss that in detail. Because it's getting out of the realm of enzymes. And it's getting more into protein, which we'll be discussing tomorrow. And I prefer that. So you make sure that we have this question again tomorrow. We'll let that wait. I've been asked several times about why is it necessary to take the um, amylase, protease, lipase, as well as food enzymes when they're all in the food enzymes. You know, if people are coming new onto the program, why do they have to take those three as well as food enzymes? The food enzymes have those combinations within them, why is it necessary to have the food enzymes plus the others? Can you just take one? 
Let's talk about the what they call the food enzymes from Enzymes International. The food enzymes will help you to digest your food. That's what it's basically for. But the design of the enzymes such as your protease is a very complex proteolytic enzyme where each of the protease enzymes are designed for knocking out a peptide linkage between two similar or dissimilar amino acids. You don't find that high degree of specialization in the food enzymes as you find in the proteolytic enzymes which are designed for breaking down the more complicated shall we say long polypeptide chains which are situated in the human body especially in the lymphatic system as what they call mucoprotein. Are you with me on that? The same thing is the complex carbohydrate which is also established in the mucoprotein that we'll talk about tomorrow. The, the amylase is designed for breaking that up which is a more complex amylytic enzyme as what would normally be used for food digestion. So what we're dealing with here is correcting the junk, body junk, which is complex fat, complex carbohydrate, complex uh, long proteolytic uh, chains, okay, chains of, of, um, of um, polypeptide chains. And what we're trying to do is to break that down in the body, which you cannot do with a simple protease amylase and lipase that you find in your regular food enzymes, which is necessary to help with your digestion, but not to correct the problems that have been long existing in the body. Does that help you? Look, I worked for years with Dr. Howells on these, the development of these enzymes uh, in, in telling him this is what I want. And finally, they got the things that I wanted in the advanced form, like, for example, the lymphatic enzymes are very, very powerful in pulling out lymphatic congestion in the body. Nothing else will do it. Okay? Nothing else will do that. Now, that, this is what, why we would use, then, the combination of amylytic enzyme plus the proteolytic enzyme in what is called the lymphatic enzymes. We used to call that the concentrated enzymes. That was changed. The name was changed several years ago when the Ness enzymes came out. Are you with me on that? Okay, so this, this whole thing is different from the enzymes used primarily for digestion, which is essential we correct the body that way too. Now this you have to understand, Lynn. Yeah, just, and, uh, and we do too. But this is important for us to really get this down so we understand it properly. Thank you for your question, Lynn. Yes, sir. Yep. What happens to the enzymes that we take and that are not used up? Can the body reuse them? If you, uh, if you read through Dr. Howell's uh, books, what Hill suggests is that there is actually fairly extensive absorbability of these enzymes into the system. And what it appears happens is that these extra enzymes that you're taking above and beyond what will be needed for the digestion of the foods, they will appear to augment the body's overall uh, metabolic enzyme potential as well. It's a little difficult to prove that concretely, but from all the, the experiments and things that Dr. Howell's done over the years, that does seem to be the case. Um, one of the main things he's, he's found is that you can take huge quantities of enzymes into the system, and they're, they're certainly not coming out unused in the, in, the, in the urine and the feces, so they're certainly going somewhere within the body. And the, the orthodox uh, medical profession will say, well, enzymes are not absorbed through the intestinal lining, uh, the reason they think that is because enzymes are not absorbed through dead intestinal lining. And they're assuming that living intestinal lining will behave the same way that dead intestinal lining will, which is, you know, apparently not the case. Uh, Doug, that's archaic. The medical profession now understands that these molecules yeah. pass right directly yeah. through the intestine. So that's uh, what you just said is ancient archaic medical concepts that are no longer uh, realistic today.
I uh, just wanted to ask about taking the hydrochloric acid to stimulate the trypsin and the pepsin and the situation where you're taking high amounts of proteolytic enzymes where the, you know, the pancreas isn't really functioning properly anyway so you, you know this is the idea of taking these proteolytic enzymes is to, to take a bit of ease off the pancreas so it can regenerate itself and give itself a rest if you're taking lots of proteolytic enzymes do you still need to take the hydrochloric acid? The hydrochloric acid is for one purpose and one purpose only and that is to lower the pH factor in the stomach where most older people cannot do that and so they need every, every older person over the age of 30 today does not have enough hydrochloric acid in their stomach to lower the pH so that the pepsin can be activated that's the reason that you take your hydrochloric acid the hydrochloric acid has absolutely nothing to do with the with the secretion of your um, of your trypsin or your uh, chy uh, uh, chymotrypsin from the pancreas. Uh, so your stomach's acidic all the time. Pardon? Your stomach is acidic all the time. So you say proteins are not going to be utilized until it's down below. You have to get, after the stomach gets down below 4.0, no more activity of the regular enzymes. When it gets down between 2 and 3, then the pepsin is activated. Okay, you with me on that? Now once that goes on into the small intestine area, then you have a large combination of factors and feedback mechanisms which control which enzymes are going to be secreted from the pancreas and also from the bush lining of the small intestine. And that's going to vary. If you're not getting the pH level up high enough, then the enzymes are. What's the effect on the stomach and the body if it's not being digested in the right place and having to wait till it gets to the lower intestine for the enzymes or for the pH to get high enough for the enzymes to work again? You have all this undigested protein running down from the stomach into the small intestines. And then you have a tremendous, tremendous job placed upon the pancreas. And here's where you oftentimes will have pancreatic disturbances at that point in time. Okay. Yeah, sorry, the one of the questions I was worried about is uh, if somebody is not actually taking a high protein diet, like who is not taking beans or meat, will it still be advisable for that person to take the hydrochloric acid supplement after the meal? My observation is that different people have a uh, widely varying, uh, shall we say, digestive force. And some people where the digestion is very, very weak will, will benefit from the hydrochloric acid even after a, a very light meal that was primarily fruit or something like that. Whereas other people might only need to use the hydrochloric acid in, in certain circumstances where they ate a very high protein meal. And I'm basing that more just on, on the way people feel when they do or do not take it. I've noticed myself that, that oftentimes after a meal that was fairly rich in protein, that if I take a hydrochloric acid, you know, say, you know, 45 minutes or half an hour after the meal, I'll notice a, a very, very obvious uh, shift in terms of the, the heaviness of the, of, the, uh, of the stomach. Whereas if I take a hydrochloric acid after a pretty light meal that didn't have much protein in it, I won't necessarily notice much of anything one way or another. So I think subjectively, I think it would vary from, you know, from one to the next. My second question is uh, the question of uh, sorry. My second question is about denaturation of the enzymes by the hydrochloric acid, which you said uh, the process is reversed once it goes into the duodenum and then the pH is lowered. Now I was wondering whether if the acid concentration is high enough, wouldn't it uh, denature the enzyme irreversibly, such that actually that uh, uh, the denaturation becomes impossible to reverse in in that other condition? That's a good question. What happens is as the pH is lowered, the in the stomach area, uh, sam Sama, is that how you, Sama? The, the pH is lowered and then the, you have the inactivation of the enzymes. 
Now, as it goes into the upper part of the small intestine, which they call the duodenum or duodenum, it's pronounced both ways, then you have a tremendous alkaline secretion coming from the, the pancreas to reverse that, at which time then the enzymes are reactivated. They're not lost, they're just reactivated. But it does put more drain on the pancreas than if part of that protein could have been digested in the, in the stomach area. Does that help? Okay, sir. John and Doug, this question is about the optimum intake of enzymes. My listening was that you said that you take food enzymes, lymphatic enzymes, uh, amylase, lipase and proteases. Uh, is, is that in fact what you're taking? If you had a large 40 pounds of junk lining the large intestine and possibly all kinds of garbage lining the small intestine up to maybe 40 pounds of it. Uh, if you were to take a whole bottle full of enzymes every day you'd probably just have some oversized bowel movements as that would slowly digest that garbage out of your small and large intestine. Now once you have cleaned out your small and large intestine and that thing is uh, working normally, then I would probably consider reducing the amount of enzymes you take. Now, without being too, shall we say, um, overly ambitious on the matter, uh, I know of people who take handfuls. Brooke, are you here, sir? Would you like to talk about this? No? <laughs> Uh, but there are those people who seem to have a, a certain um, uh, ambitious, competitive nature to see who can take the most enzymes and see who can have the fastest he and longest healing crises and, and see who can get their bodies in better shape and their eye color changed the fastest. Is that correct? Possibly. <laughs> but there are people who will do this. But uh, the thing is, um, I didn't want to name names that aren't here. I'll talk about Brooke because he is here. You can talk about Graham. <laughs> well, some of you know Graham Clare, but uh, he told me he was in New Caledonia and he was really going to get into enzymes there. Heavy brown eyes. Yeah, he had brown eyes in, at the time. And he started taking, I believe it was, nine of each enzyme three times a day. And he said he went to work, and he just couldn't put the tissues down. I mean, he was blowing his nose every second, tissue after tissue after tissue. He was afraid his boss was going to say something already. But um, all that mucus just, just started flowing out of him, and then his eyes, they turned green after that. And they're bluish green now. Yeah. The, uh, the quick answer to your question, David, is to the optimum amount of enzymes is find out how much Brooke is taking and divide by five. That's a... It's an individual thing. John, you gave the um, answer to someone who asked a, a question about five questions ago and you described the difference between the lymphatic enzymes, which have the concentrated version, and the food enzymes. But I think they wanted to know the difference between the individual food enzymes and the, and the general food en enzymes, which is nothing. It's, just, it's, it's they're separate, isn't it? Someone asked a question a while ago, and you told them the difference between the lymphatic, which have the concentrated enzymes, and the general food enzymes, which is the, uh, you know, a low form of food enzymes. But I think they actually wanted to know the difference between the individual lipase, amylase, and protease, and the general food enzymes, and they're actually the same. But it's in the individual ones as well. Oh, yes. oh right. Oh, yes. right. I didn't, didn't get that. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Uh, my question concerns the use of the hydrochloric acid again. Um, I was wondering, assuming if somebody is taking enough food enzymes at the beginning of the meal to fully digest the contents of the meal, and then uh, they're taking the 
of, say, a fairly strong dose of hydrochloric acid, is that going to force the pancreas to secrete unnecessary enzymes to neutralize the pH? Not necessarily. I wouldn't say so. Uh, I would say that uh, the, it would save, if anything, the activity of the pancreas from over-functioning because when you take uh, these food enzymes and so on into your system, then the pancreas doesn't have to, to secrete those same enzymes, at that, which therefore you're giving that pancreas a chance to relax and to heal. How is the acidity of the um, stomach contents then neutralized? You're dealing with an acid uh, uh, base concept here, set rather than an enzyme situation. And so you're dealing with something which is basic being secreted from uh, bicarbonate ions, this sort of thing, which then would then counter the activity of the hydrogen ions and bring up the, bring up the, um, shall we say, the, the uh, alkalinity of the fluids itself, okay? Two, we're talking apples and oranges there. Um, Would it be correct to say that the lymphatic enzymes are to digest the garbage out of the lymphatic system and the individual protease, lipase and amylase will digest the garbage from the rest of the body? Is that the idea? So that's the difference between them. Yeah. And you need both, therefore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if it was correct to say that the lymphatic enzymes <coughs> will digest the garbage out of the lymphatic system specifically and that the other individual enzymes will digest the garbage from the rest of the body and therefore you need both. And that's the difference between them. We've, we haven't understood this before. Uh, I would say that your lymphatic enzymes would work on the entire body, not just the lymphatics. I know a lot of people that are only taking lymphatic and food enzymes. Will that be adequate or not? I know a lot of people in my whole area that are just taking food enzymes and lymphatic. They might take a lot of the lymphatic, a big spoon, but they're not taking the other ones. De well, depends. Well, some people would take that if they have a problem, you know, atherosclerosis or iris indications. Um, it depends upon the person. Now, if a person has a lot of fatty lumps in their body, they should certainly be on the, the lipase individual enzyme, which would be designed for knocking that out, which it will in time. Um, take about th maybe three or four months for that to happen. But that's after a person's had that for years. Um, the lipase is not going to be just uh, for digestion alone. It's for really cleaning out the body junk that doesn't belong there, which can be fatty substance. It can be, uh, the, like with the lymphatic enzymes, that would be for the mucoprotein and so on. I, did I answer your question? Okay, what should I have said? Yeah, same, same principle. The regular food enzymes are for digestion. But you can take the individual enzymes, and they're still going to work on your digestion, but they're going to work on the other junk in the body as well. It's not, it's not just a black and white situation. And they still can be used for digestion also. Because the, the power that's there, the, there's nothing immune from them. Pardon me? What's your question? Um, is it correct to say that someone with cancer should also have the protease? They have to have the extra protease, and people with diabetes have to have the extra amylase. And fat problems have to have the extra lipase. But um, take them all. Yes. Mm. stand correcting on this. Um, nature in her wisdom says that we 
chew our food in the mouth, pre preferably with our lips closed, uh, because the, the brain needs to know what chemicals are in the food as it goes into the stomach, what sort of enzymes and digestive material is needed. Now, when we take capsules, the question is, does our brain know what sort of uh, enzymes are in the capsules once they're in the stomach? My assumption, Peter, would be that the brain would have no idea what was in the capsules unless you chewed the capsules. Whereas if you took it in either a powder or a tablet form, and with the tablets, you know, made sure you chewed it up a little bit before you swallowed it, then the brain would know what was there just as it would know what, what was in the food. But if you took the, cap, the, the um, capsules down and you hadn't chewed them at all, then the brain would have no idea until such time, which might be 15, 20 minutes later, as th that the capsules would dissolve. With the powder, the major problem you have is that it will, uh, if it gets at all moist, you're going to inactivate the enzymes. So you have to be very, very careful with the powder. They won't, they, it won't be suitable in some climates because of the, um, the moisture problem. But what you can very readily do with the capsules is simply just chew them. You know, just bite them once so that the powder gets out and mixes in with the food a little bit. Yes, for people who uh, are not used to working with enzymes, the powdered are very reactive. So you really have to be careful with that and also putting it in the sunlight. Uh, we had a batch that was in the sun and they, they uh, just tested weak after a while. So be careful with putting your enzymes in sunlight and, uh, yes, Lewis, and with moisture. The question is, will the powder be activated in this particular climate? And the answer to that is yes, very badly. Very humid. The other thing, what I used to do is I used to open my capsules. So, of course, do not put it on hot food uh, because then it'll just be activated right at that moment. Uh, first of all, can you come up to the mic? In asking that question, you, the point is, in this climate, it's not good, but is that after the bottle's opened and it becomes exposed, or even when it's in the bottle, unopened, you know, as new? You know what I mean? And you're not supposed to put it in the fridge either, so according to the bottle. What we're finding is even the plastic, even if you get the very best plastic, it's hydroscopic. It will slowly absorb in the, uh, the moisture. And there's no way that you can keep it out of a plastic bottle. Just can't do it. Um, I think Lynn's first. Well, I just wanted to go back to what you said a minute ago and, can, and sort of clarify it for myself. Food enzymes were for digestion only, basically, and the other ones are more specialized for digestion plus sort of working on the old stuff in the body as well. Is that is how I understood it? And the other one was earlier. Doug, did you say that it's best to take the enzymes at the beginning of a meal, not at the middle, in the middle or the end? If, if you consider that the body is going to secrete specific types of enzymes, whether lipase, amylase, or protease, in direct response to the types of foods that are consumed, one of the, one of the things that you're trying to do is to spare the body from having to do that. In other words, you're trying to, to use as much of the enzymes from outside as possible. And so if you wait till, till well after you've eaten your meal to consume your, your enzyme supplements, your body has no idea they're coming and it's going to already have secreted a lot of its own enzymes. Now, you're not going to lose the extra enzymes that you're taking because they will go into the system and get absorbed and used somewhere else. But as far as the amount of work that your pancreas is doing secreting enzymes, you're going to get much more of a... Uh, break for the pancreas if you get your if you consume your enzymes at the beginning of the meal than you would if you waited till after the meal, which is which is what I see a lot of people doing. And then you just said about chewing the capsules because I'm sort of taking capsules. How long does it take for if you haven't chewed them for them to dissolve, sort of when they get down to the stomach? Uh, I don't know the exact amount of time, but I get bet at least you know five or ten minutes. I would think. 
there are some people that are very much opposed to, to eating the capsules. And they use it, the capsule, as a measuring and measure it out in their food and take it where it's not poured down on, on um, shall we say, hot food that would destroy the enzymes. Uh, but there are some people who believe that the animal, shall we say, the, uh, the horse's hooves and pig hooves and so on that the capsules are made of, uh, even though it has been processed heavily, it's just not for the human consumption. So even though people say chew the capsules and they don't make an issue out of it because they need to get the enzymes more in their body than worry about uh, where, the, where the gelatin capsules came from, there's, uh, this is something I want you to consider is that you're dealing with an animal product. And if you're a strict vegetarian, then you're not going to eat the capsules. You didn't want to hear that. Uh, just to clarify something on the pH, um, you need a low pH to activate the pepsin, right? And then I take it you need a high pH to activate the amylase, lipase, and protease. That's right. Okay, thanks. It's not a very high pH for the food enzymes. It just has to be above about a 4. So it still can be an acidic pH, but it's a, it's a higher pH than you need for the, for the pepsin, which is down between about a 2 and a 3. I have a vested interest in food enzyme powder, having two dozen plastic bottles on their way, and I'll leave both of them here. And I want to say that my experience here is that I haven't had any trouble with food enzyme powders uh, being affected by moisture in a fortnight. Yeah, and at home they last, which is a similar climate to here, not quite as hot, uh, three weeks or a month, no trouble. Good. Trouble. If you're into a year of storage, you may be in trouble on those things. Now, normally you have a 2% loss of enzyme activity in one year of storage. But the thing is, the moisture is still going to be a problem no matter what kind of plastic you have. Yeah, and also, I think they uh, deactivate if you keep putting the spoon in you know, like wet spoons and things like that, if you're putting it in, and if people take precautions with that, I'm sure they'll be fine. Okay, well, uh, I guess back to the 12 points on enzymes. We, we made it through, uh, if you'll remember, we made it through number zero so far, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on to number one here. Question? Well, we'll take another question first. Uh, when you're taking the powdered enzymes, can you just take the spoon out, dump it in some water, mix it up, and drink it down? Is that going to affect it or not? Uh, cold water, cool water. The, the only thing that I would say is that for, for a lot of people, particularly where their digestion is on the weak side, if they're consuming a lot of liquids with the meals, it's going to hinder the digestion. So it's a good idea if you can keep the amount of, of fluids that you're consuming at mealtime down, down to a minimum. Well, dare I do it, number one? Okay. Okay. It's important stuff. I'm glad you're asking questions. Okay, uh, number one. Enzymes rule over all other nutrients. Enzymes are responsible for nearly every facet of life and health and far outweigh the importance of every other nutrient. An analogy that I, that I uh, think is a fairly good one with respect to enzymes, if you consider the, the different categories of essential nutrients, things like your essential amino acids, your essential minerals, your essential fatty acids, your vitamins and so forth, the thing to realize is none of these other nutrients are, are going to do you a lot of good if you don't have the enzymes present in order to utilize these nutrients. And, and a good analogy here is if you want to build a house, it's all very well and good to get all the bricks and the wood and the nails and the roofing material and have that dumped in your yard ready to go, but you still have to have a workforce to put it together in some sort of meaningful fashion, or at least you can get Ian to do it if you don't have a workforce. 
but bottom line is you need that workforce to assemble the materials. You need the workforce, the, uh, the labor force, to actually get some use out of all those building materials. And so no matter how many minerals and vitamins and amino acids and, and everything else that you take, you're not going to really get a lot of benefit if you're enzyme deficient because you're just the body's simply not capable of using these other items without, without an abundance of enzyme activity. Case in point, January of 1980, I had the opportunity of looking at a person's eyeballs and putting them on a program back in Chicago, Illinois. And this person had 17 black bushes in one eye and 13 black bushes in the other eye, in the iris of the eye, black bushes. She had these lumps and bumps all over her body that she didn't want to get checked up on because she was afraid of what it might be. And the eyes confirmed it. We'll talk about this in iridology. I put her on a program and I came back to Chicago five months later. I took a look at her eyes. Zero change. She was taking the minerals. She was taking other substances I had her on, all of the vitamins, the minerals, and whatnot. We didn't have the enzymes at that time. And, uh, but I had her on a fresh and raw diet to take care of the enzyme need. Well, she said she was taking the program absolutely perfectly and doing exactly what I had asked her to do except she couldn't stand the rabbit food of fresh and raw salads and fresh and raw food. She had to have everything cooked. Well, this is wherein there was the enzyme deficiency. Now, what Doug just said is right on but the fact that if you don't have your enzymes, you cannot absorb the other nutrients in the body, such as the minerals. Without the enzymes and the minerals together, you can't get... Uh, uh, absorbed into the body the various vitamins and a lot of people are on vitamin kicks and they they spend thousands of dollars on vitamins but they make no progress because there's no minerals and there's no enzymes well this lady made no progress and then from in one month's time of the 15, uh, 17 black bushes in one eye that was down to two black spots all of the feelers that had you know the big uh, looked like a little tree growing out there was all gone, and uh, but uh, everything had was either brown or was disappearing. And the other eye, same thing. She had two little black spots left. Everything was gone. But the secret that she did is she went heavy on a fresh and raw diet, and that was the only difference. And then she made the progress. And this is if if I can't. By looking at this, if I can't see the importance of enzymes, then something's wrong with me. Because the change in the iris of the eye. If the eye is not changing color and structure, then something is wrong with the nutritional program or the point-holding program. And therefore, we have to make a lot of internal adjustments on that. As John always likes to say, the proof is in the pudding. If you're looking at a person that's putting forth a lot of uh, effort and not really having much to, uh, much to show for it, you have to go back to the drawing board sometimes and you have to ask yourself you know, what, you need to, what you need to be doing differently. Sometimes the problem is something that you're still doing. It, it may be a bad habit that you haven't given up, but more often than not, it's, it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that there's things that you should be doing that you haven't bothered to do yet. And oftentimes we need to up a certain nutrient or add a certain nutrient, but whatever other nutrients we're taking, we're not going to get a whole lot of mileage out of them without the, without the enzymes because they're this, by far the single most important item. Shift. I'm going to shift gear here a bit because I have all these little thoughts just rattling through my head like screaming out at me to talk about. One of the biggest problems that we have I want you all to just really take note is the principle of resistance. And a lot of people do not understand the importance of resistance because people will not get well from their physical disabilities until the resistance is removed from their psyche, from their thinking, from their emotions. Because what you resist you'll continually perpetuate in your life. If you resist pain, then you'll have pain. 
If you resist a breast tumor, then you'll have the continuation of the breast tumor. If you have a arthritic condition that you resist, you'll have perpetuation of that arthritic condition. And oftentimes, we look for a cause outside of ourselves as the cause of the arthritis or the cause of the problem that we have, whatever that problem might be. And sometimes the cause may be something external. It may be pollution in the atmosphere. It may be pollution in the food that we're eating. It may be a deficiency in something that we're eating. And this is true. There may be a problem there. But I find that in the most cases, the problems exist in the human mind where something will be happening and they say, I just can't stand it. And you find out what the person just can't stand, and that'll be the source of their resistance. Because what they resist, they will perpetuate in their life. Therefore, lesson, if I were to put a number on a lesson, this is a very important number one lesson to learn. There are many number one lessons to learn. But this is learn to follow the pathway of non-resistance. And look at every single experience as a blessing and an opportunity for growth rather than something to resist and avoid. Now, if you're anything like I am, you're going to be kicking and screaming in some areas. And those will be the areas that we need to learn. That will be our teaching experience where we need to learn the best. Now, therefore, any resistance that we have, we will be perpetuating that resistance. Now, hang on for just a moment. Let's look at that resistance business. You find the thing in your life that you don't like the most. And let that go. And look at the opposite and be willing to look at both aspects at the same, with the same degree of impartiality. Years ago, one of my kahuna teachers told me a story of his training as a kahuna, where he had to sit cross-legged in a valley in the West Maui Mountains. And he had to sit up where the upper part of his body, his neck and his head were exposed, and he had to sit cross-legged in this muddy, mosquito-infested pond five days without sleep. And during that time, this all he did was sitting in the mud. And he couldn't figure out why in the world he had to sit in this mud with this, uh, with this uh, kahuna sitting over him, hitting him on the side of the head every time he moved. That's, uh, that's self-control. Um, some of you haven't been through the visualization and consciousness class yet. But the thing is, is that in the situation here, after the third day, natural human functions took over and he defecated up there in the pond. He couldn't hold it back. He had, he had to let it go. At that time, the kahuna went down there with his hand, grabbed all that defecation, shit, mind you, smeared it in his nose, in his eyes, in his ears, all over his face, in his head and hair, and left him sitting there, wondering why. Because that was a putrid experience for him. He couldn't stand it with his resistance. So he continued to sit there and pondering on this until he understood a principle. And this was how he expressed it to me. Is that when you're capable of looking at the slime of the sewer with the same degree of impartiality as the fragrance of the rose, then you have arrived at the point of non-resistance. I want you to think about that for just a few minutes. Because most of us have our druthers. I'd rather have it this way than that way. And I've got to have it this way because I'm more comfortable in this comfort zone here than I am over here. And we can't have things just one way. We have to have it another way. We have our druthers, as I call it. I'd rather have it this way than that way. I'd rather have it that way, you know, and so on. Now, here's where our resistances come up. And 
we will tell ourselves, well, I'm totally justified in wanting it that way. Now that resistance may not be our resistance, and maybe genetically our mother's resistance, or our father's resistance, or the resistance of our grandparents, because genetically we will inherit these things. So there's other factors that enter in that we have to look at. But if we can train ourselves every second of the day, every moment of the day, to learn to lovingly and willingly endure all things, to learn to follow with a dedication, with a passion, the pathway of non-resistance. Then we start moving toward that position where it's all right, whatever. Now this is what I say, whatever is okay. And whatever happens in my life, I say it. I don't practice it fully yet because I still have my little bit of resistances here and there. Big resistances here and there. Let's be honest, shall we? All right. But the thing is, is we reach a point of resistance where we look at it, we let it go, and we dedicate ourselves to follow that pathway of non-resistance. This is the pathway that we must take if we're going to be able to conquer some of the problems which we have in our physical bodies that are in this room. And you can take as much enzymes as you want. You can take as much nutrients as you want. But if you can't control the mind, the human mind, and bring the emotions into submission, and take the position, whatever, with gratitude and love, we'll continue to have sickness which is generated by our resistances. Because our concepts, our thinking will be focused upon that. I hope this helps a little bit. Anita, do you want to add? Uh, there's a really beautiful story in the autobiography of a yoga, yogi about non-resistance. And I'll tell it to you now briefly. It's a little, oh, in a condensed form. But anyway, there was a... Uh, the police were told in India that there was a thief out and he's dressed in the uh, costume of a sage. So this one policeman all of a sudden saw this man from the back, and he looked like a sage. And he said to him, Stop! Stop, you thief! And this uh, person kept on walking, and the police asked him again, Stop! And he continued to walk. And so finally he took out one of his swords, his big swords, and hit him on the arm. And his arm is practically dangling there off of his body. And uh, this person, the sage, turns around and the policeman sees his face and he recognizes him as one of the most holy men there in India. And so he gets down on the floor and he starts bowing and he takes off his turban off of his head and he wraps his arm up and all the blood is just pouring all on the street and everything. And the sage just says to him, I'm not the person you wanted. And uh, he, he looks at him and says, in three days, if you meet me under the tree, you'll see my, my arm is completely healed. And he just walked away. And in three days, the policeman did go there and his arm was completely healed. But the point of it is that he didn't yell at the policeman. I mean, this is to the extreme. I mean, we get, we get mad when the person just knocks us in a supermarket or a line or whatever. But this man, he had his arm dangling off of him, and yet he still was not upset. He was not upset with the policeman. He just, comp just answered his question, I'm not the person you're looking for. What does body electronics do as reference to resistance? What do you do when you press a point? All the resistance comes out. So if we have a part of the body that hasn't healed yet, then somewhere there's resistance that we haven't dealt with. Maggie wants to talk to us. <laughs> Don't move, Maggie. We'll call on you. 
one of the uh, statements that John's always made over the years is that the nutritional program is about 10% at most of the total program of body electronics. And that's something I think is very important for people to understand. We're, we're going to go into a lot of detail on, on things like enzymes and minerals and amino acids and all the rest. And this is very important information, and it, and it is quite essential that you have a, a good mastery of it. But bear in mind that no matter how much you understand about nutrition, you're still not getting any more than 10% of the picture there. And one of the things that we've seen down through the years is a lot of people get into body electronics and they're never able to see beyond the, the nutrition and, the, and the, 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 the bare mechanics of the point holding process. You know, we get certain people that figure as long as they're taking the supplements and as long as they're, you know, plugged in on, on the points and the points are getting hot, that they ought to be getting somewhere. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work quite that simply. Why You're, isn't this working for me? Why isn't this working? One, one of the things I found down in Hamilton that was kind of amusing was a lot of the people there where they were holding points two and three and four times a week, they thought maybe they weren't getting anywhere because they weren't holding points often enough. That was the standard answer I, I got there. And I, I, I tried to explain to people as best I could that it was... It wasn't a question of quantity, it was a question of quality. I mean, if you're looking at, get, at getting some results with body electronics, it's not a, it's not a question of how, how often you do it, it's a question of how well you do it when you're doing it. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, there were people here this morning talking about having uh, scars disappear 90% in, a, in, 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 in five minutes' time. I mean, things don't have to take a long time to, uh, to happen in body electronics. We've seen all sorts of things happen in a you know, wink of an eye. What happened last year? Here. Oh, uh, we had a. How many people were here last year? Just ra raise your hands there. Okay, so you, if you, uh, if you, uh, any, of you, any of the rest of you folks, you might want to uh, ask any of these people for uh, what what they've seen here, and these guys can all uh, make sure I'm telling it like it is here. We had a a, a woman here from out in uh, Western Australia by the name of Rena Campbell, and uh, she had had a. Uh, some of you have probably heard the same story on the videotapes, but. Uh, Rena had been in a car wreck about eight years previous, and she had uh, had a lot of damage to the uh, to the face and the jaw in particular. And she'd had a surgery where they'd removed on one side uh, a big chunk of her of her jawbone, the lower jawbone, right where it went up into the TMJ joint, left side. left side. They'd removed a big chunk of it there, so she actually had kind of a hole there, you know, there, where there really wasn't a, a joint because the bone from the lower jaw was missing about a maybe an inch, and a half, an inch and a half, you know, say three or four centimeters of, uh, of jawbone was missing. And she had a number of other problems. She had a lot of uh, nerve damage, so there were areas of her face where she didn't really have any uh, feeling or sensation, and she didn't have any control of the muscles. Her one eye was totally locked in place where she couldn't... Uh... Actually, Peter, you're, you probably ought to come up and tell, tell some of this here. You're, you're a, you were at the scene of the crime there. I come on the scene at the, the last moment, really. Um, Rena had had, um, I think, about nine months of point holding from Perth when she arrived here. And uh, I think, what, was it the first week? It was in the first week, I think, we were here. First day. The first day? Yeah. Your memory's not always correct, is it? Um, the first day. Yeah? Okay, well, Rena was really repaired then if it happened on the first day. Uh, John, John called her up to the front. She'd been talking to John about her problem with the uh, the accident, in the car accident, and she couldn't chew it. She she could hardly chew at all. She couldn't. The jaw movement was difficult, just straight up and down. There was no side movement. Um, she came out the front, and sat in a chair, and John pressed on the second cervical, which was related to the nerves of the jawbone. Um, I think it was inside 12 minutes, 12 minutes, and uh, there was, a, say, 90% reconstruction of the jaw. In the accident, the top part of the medulla bone, 
The surgeons had removed that. It was too badly damaged in the accident. Uh, they'd removed that portion of it. That actually grew back in that um, 12, and 12 minutes. And she was very delighted because at meals time she could now chew up and down. The problems was still there in the eye movement because I'd photographed her eyes, uh, well it must have been, yeah it was after that, I photographed her eyes. She was still having a lot of difficulty in the left eye, um, that was virtually static, there's no, no movement in, in that at all. The right eye was okay, but she had no feeling in the cheeks because in the surgery the nerves had been severed and the, the cheek was numb. Um, when it came to the cranial, um, I was fortunate enough to uh, work with Rena and through that session, um, you'll, you'll learn that later on in the cranial, but she was the fingers were on the side and she kept pulling them off the cheek because the the nerves were coming back. First you get a tingling and then you get the feeling in the in the cheeks. And she was pulling my fingers. I mean there was only very gently laying on her face. But she was pulling them off because that was the first time that she had had feeling in that side. And then she got a side movement of that jaw. So she got complete uh, mastication back in the jaw where she could move it up and down sideways, she could chew properly, which we all should be able to do. Uh, later on when it came to the the palate section which you'll learn about in the cranial, the left eye came back to normal, she had complete control. A bone structure completely changed, the eyes came forward, uh, but she was on the, the brink of enduring the pain all of the time. And this, the time that we'd go over the cranials was, uh, certainly wasn't 12 minutes, a lot longer than that. It runs into hours. But she experienced the whole of the operation, that's the cutting and the grinding and, and every sensation that, that she would have felt if she hadn't have been under anaesthetic that's necessary to uh, experience that to get the complete healing in the uh, in the jaw. Okay. Peter, will you try your best to present to this body of lovely people how much pain Rena had to go through at that time? You, you just made it sound like you're just, just uh, you know, falling off a log. Uh, would you let the people know how, how it was? Well, it's difficult to know how much pain a person uh, is, is really under, but what we did, we had a signaling technique where she just held her fingers because in the cranial you've got, you've got your thumb or a finger in their mouth and you can't talk to each other very well. So we had a signaling thing that it, that was okay and if the pain was too much it was closed. And most of the time it was sort of there and there. Uh, and of course, um, I knew that it had to be, she had to have as much pain to get the result that she could endure, that's lovingly willingly enduring it. But Rena was, knew that she had to go through that and uh, she was virtually in, in pain the whole of the time until you get the healing comes through and then the pain goes completely. But the pain returns by an itching sensation, then a vibration, then the pain, and that goes stronger and stronger until you get the actual uh, recondition. Would that do? No, talk about pain. Well, when a person's trembling, oh, that's pain. Uh, you get vibration, that's a little bit different, but I mean, when they're under pain for that length of time, and cranial pain is a lot more than you'd experience in uh, normal point holding, because it's, it's extremely close to the brain and uh, 
the brain doesn't like that sort of pain close to it. You can, you can, you can probably isolate yourself a bit too if it's down on your toes, but when it's happening right in the palate and right in the mouth, that's a, that's a little bit different. But, uh, Does she go back and re-experience all of her dental surgery? Every detail of the accident, every detail that had ever happened in the in the uh, cranial area, yes. Did she feel the pain of the abstractions of the teeth? Everything, because and this just doesn't happen in a few minutes. This goes on for hours virtually. Does she feel the pain though, without Novocaine? Well, yes, you experience everything you would have experienced if you didn't have the uh, the effects of the Novocaine. We just lost half our class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? Going back, all of the suppressed pain. Oh, excuse me. All of the suppressed pain that a person went through on dental surgery, in this case operations, the grinding, all of the cutting and so on that was done under anesthesia, she had to re-experience it totally consciously as if there was no anesthetic whatsoever. Now some of you are having trouble with certain problems that aren't resolved yet. But this will tell you that there's pain that you haven't experienced yet. Because when you experience that pain properly, then you will have that part of the body literally regenerate. I think there's something that I need to say is Rena had, had been in prayer for quite a, some time and she'd made a, a contract with God for this healing. Are you saying everyone's here by appointment? Absolutely. So I always, I always get a kick out of listening to Peter describe this because I, I kind of get the feeling that he would use the same tone of voice to tell you somebody's arm grew back as he would to tell you what was for breakfast. <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes we tend to miss the, uh, you know, the, uh, the intensity of the, of, the, of the whole thing there. But, you know, we're talking somebody who had probably an inch or an inch and a half of their jawbone grow back in 12 minutes. I mean, just, you know, just consider that simple statement, and that, that's something that I think for most people, let me put it to you this way, most of the people who, most people who, who haven't seen something like that happen would have a very hard time believing it, but the thing to realize is half the people that did see it happen still had a very hard time believing it, you know, so don't feel too bad if you're having a hard time swallowing some of these, uh, some of these things here. Now, if we look at this, uh, this situation here, I think, I think there's something that's, that's very, very important to understand, and I think Peter would, would verify this. Rena was very, very well prepared in a lot of different ways for this, uh, for this healing to occur. She was certainly very well prepared nutritionally. She'd been on a very good program for quite some time, supplements, diet, and all the rest. But it's important to recognize that that degree of physical preparation, as essential as it is, is still just the tip of the iceberg. As John would say, 10% at best of what's going to be necessary for somebody to, uh, to heal. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years in, in, uh, in body electronics is that when people are getting ready for a point holding session, your average individual will place a tremendous emphasis on their, on their physical, uh, particularly their nutritional preparation for a session. So I'll notice when people are getting into point holding and getting into cranials, they'll take a lot of extra supplements and you'll see people gulping down lots of extra minerals and enzymes before they hit the table. And yet, in my observation, most people do not seem to devote the same degree of attention to the spiritual preparation that's necessary for a, for a point holding session. And I'm glad that Peter mentioned that, where Rena had, be, had prepared herself on many other levels be, beyond just the, uh, just the physical level. And I think it's very, very important for you all, for you all here to understand that, that the, you know, the physical preparation is the, is the tip of the iceberg. We've seen a lot, of, in fact, I've seen a lot of people in the last year who've had some fairly tremendous things happen to them in body electronics in a single point, hold, in a single point holding session without any nutritional preparation whatsoever. And when I've uh, followed up on it with these people after the, after the fact, I might add, I found without exception that these were people that had been praying and meditating for many, many years. This is something I want you, I want you all to consider. A, uh, an example of this, a woman that uh, 
Peter and Olivia and a few others of you might know from down in the uh, Melbourne area, uh, Mira uh, Klo, uh, she came in for, uh, uh, at her daughter's suggestion to, uh, to get an eye reading. And this was a woman who was uh, 79 years old at the time. And she had broken her, uh, broken her foot uh, quite badly about 13 years previous to this, uh, to this time that we met her. This was just last February. And her foot, now you know Mira, correct? You know Mira as well, John? Yeah. And her foot had been broken so badly that she could not even put her, uh, she couldn't place her foot. This was her right foot. She had, for 13 years, she'd been incapable, it had been impossible for her to place her foot flat on the floor like that. The foot, the foot had been broken so badly and, and it healed up so crooked that her foot was kind of at an angle like that. And she had special, you know, special lifts built into her shoes and all that sort of thing. She came in for, for an eye reading at her daughter's suggestion. Didn't know the first thing about body electronics. Really, all she knew was like, you know, go to such and such a building at, you know, 2 o'clock and see this, uh, you know, this Morrison guy. And no nutritional preparation whatsoever. And we ended up doing some point holding on her foot. And she had a pretty well about a 90% reconstruction of her foot in about 40 minutes. Without the slightest degree of nutritional preparation, without any prior experience in body electronics, and uh, really with very little explanation of what was going on other than let me know if I'm pushing too hard and, and uh, go back through the accident. I mean, that was about the, the extent of the, uh, you know, the, uh, shall we say, prior guidance. And one of the things that I found after the fact in, in uh, talking to her was this is a woman that had been meditating daily for about 35 years. And this is somebody that had been doing a tremendous amount of spiritual preparation. And uh, I've, I've just seen this over and over again when we have people that get these very rapid and, and immediate results in body electronics. These are people that have, they, may well, they may not have always prepared themselves all that much physically, but they've pretty much without exception been preparing themselves spiritually. And I would really encourage all of you here to make, it, to make that your priority. Don't neglect the physical. Don't neglect the nutritional by any means. But make sure you put out an equal degree of emphasis onto the spiritual. I, I, I find far too many of us, I'm, I include myself in this category often, I find far too many of us, uh, the prayers are almost an afterthought, you know, something we mumble as we jump onto the table, and not something that we start doing days or weeks in advance of the point-holding session. And I would really strongly encourage all of you to get into the, into the habit of putting out, those, putting out those prayers for the highest and best good for yourself as well as everyone else involved here at this, here at this seminar. If we're going to receive uh, the healings that we're looking for, it's important to recognize that whatever, whatever good comes of this, it's not, the, uh, it's not the point holders that are healing you. It's not the facilitator that's healing you. It's not the teacher that's healing you. And if you want to be perfectly honest, it's not even you yourself that are healing you. It's the God within you. It's the God presence within each one of us that is the, that is the true source of all the healing. And the thing to realize is there's a tremendous amount of help available for all of us an absolutely tremendous amount of help, freely available. But what do we have to bother to do first? We have to bother to ask for it. And I think this is one area where, where many of us have, been, uh, have fallen a bit short in, in years past, and it's something that I think we're starting to get more on the ball about. And I would, I would really strongly encourage all of you to do this. Put out your requests, and whatever, you know, whether it's through your prayers, your meditations, your affirmations, your decrees, whatever, whatever method you find comfortable, Put the requests out. If you don't have a method yet, it's no time like the present to get one. For every law, you're going to find that that law will be encompassed by a higher law. And for the most part, if you break a lower law, then you are condemned, shall we say, to suffer the consequences of that broken lower law, unless you are covered by obedience to a higher law. When you're dealing with point holding, you're dealing with something here that is exceedingly important to understand, because on one hand, where does the healing come from? Doug said it. I want him to say it again. It would come from the God presence within each one of us. It would come from our own, our own God self. There's a, a, lo a distortion that a lot of people will bring into point holding where they believe that the, the healing is coming from outside of themselves. A lot of people will feel it's the facilitator or the point holders that are doing it. 
And that's very definitely a, 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 a great distortion of truth. But I believe it's an equal distortion of truth to feel that we ourselves are doing it without any help. I mean, as a mortal, as a mortal intel, as a mortal intelligence, it's really the the higher part of ourselves, which you can call your I am presence, your God presence, any any of a number of names. But it's really this this source within you, where, which is where the healing is coming from. That is what I would call the beginning of the law, and this is wherein you would be looking at this particular law principle that Doug is pointing out to begin with. But you're going to find that there is a law that circumscribes this to where an individual is capable of taking on, shall we say, the karma of a very close friend or a wife or a husband or children or students and is capable of transmuting that material of the individual by taking on the pain of that person and transmuting that pain of that person, which they're cap a person is capable of doing at a very high level. And you're going to find some people who are on the table and they don't go through one ounce of pain or problem but you'll have seven people around that person holding points on that person and that person ends up completely healed of an affliction with everyone else going through absolute pain. What happened there? The seven people went through pain who were holding that person's points. Seven people went through terrible pain and the person on the table just simply slept through it all. Now what happened there? Now here is wherein you're going to have to realize that there's an interaction where some people can take on, through point holding, that other person's pain and transmute it to where that individual does not have to go through that pain. And you find that's happening oftentimes in a family situation. A husband point, holds the points on the wife and the husband just gets jolted with electricity and the wife doesn't feel a thing. And yet when it's over and done with, the heart's all healed, lungs are all healed, the person's back up and going strong again. But they didn't experience anything. Now the question you're going to have to look at here is a philosophical question. Does a person have to go individually through their own pain? Or is, it capable, is one capable of releasing a person from that pain by taking on that pain themselves for that individual. I want you to think about this now. Because if you say everyone has to go through their own pain and they have to go through their own karma, then you will not believe in body electronics. If everyone has to go through their own stuff, you know, and, and we take a very cold, hard-hearted stance on this, they got to pay the price of their pain, they got to go through it all, if you believe that, then you don't believe in body electronics. And so here is wherein, on one hand, the person goes through their own pain, but you have a far progressive situation where if one person in a family, or even distantly related, goes through the pain morphogenetically you're dealing with the emotionality of that individual and everyone on the same DNA level is going to be freed of that pain and they will not have to go through it all they will have to do is accept what's been done for them because now in that area they have instant access to the mental body do you hear me? Do you hear me? Anybody there? Do you hear me? Okay. Just want to check. Are you hearing me out there? Okay. And so what you're doing is looking past 
the concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth where everyone has to pay the price of their own, um, shall we say, foolishness, which is the law of justification. And you're moving quickly from the law of justification through that to the law who knows what the next law above the law of justification is? Purification. Individual purification. And here's where you deal with your own stuff. And then you go beyond that into the law of sanctification, where you transmute on the emotional body level that pain that everyone that you have in that family of that DNA pattern will have the benefit from that without ever having to go through their own pain because it's done for them. This is the gift that is given, which is called the gift of grace. This is the gift of grace. And this gift of grace is the concept of the violet consuming flame, which a person will go through. They'll feel that pain and they'll see this huge blue blast of energy, violet blast of energy, that goes through their mind at that point of time. And that entire painful episode in their body, all cause, all effect, all record, and all memory are gone into oblivion. And the people who are tied in at the DNA level are totally free of that position because of the sanctification process of one member of the family doesn't matter how distantly related, everyone gets the fallout from that. Question, sir? Uh, 